All right, I think we're good now. So uh, this is an example of a standing wave. Uh, this, is, this would be a standing wave that's in an open-ended pipe. And uh, you can see that it oscillates. The reason it's called a standing wave is because the position of the crests and the troughs and the nodes doesn't change as a function of time. Notice that, uh, and, and the nodes are these positions where the wave crosses uh, zero. So let's say this is zero. This is positive something. Uh, just for fun, we'll put it as plus one up here. This is minus one or something like that. And the positions of these maxima don't change with time, though the amplitude does. Notice that at each point, uh, if we were to freeze the image in time, whoa, maybe that does it, I don't know. If we were to freeze the image in time, we could color in the areas of the curve that are, have positive amplitude, right? Uh, and that would be all of these areas above the x-axis. And you thought the math was gonna be hard. Um, actually, there's hardly any math in this class, so that's a good thing. Uh, so there's areas of, well, let's see, I'll just show this. And then there's areas where we're below the curve. Okay? Um, and often in chemistry, we will use different colors to indicate different uh, relative signs of waves. By sign, I mean the mathematical sign, not sign, S-I-N-E, anyway. Um, here the wave is positive, here the wave is negative. Notice that the wave isn't hopping from one place to another, that is, uh, it's positive in this section, it's negative in this section, but the wave is in both places at once. That's one of the neat things about waves is they can be multiple places at once. All right. Um, another kind of standing wave, let's see, sorry, getting ahead of myself. The places where the wave goes to zero, we're going to call those nodes. And I don't know why. Each one is a node. Um, I can't say that word without thinking of how my children pronounce, pronounce the word nerd when they were young. Hello, node. Um, all right, and nodes are important. These are places where the amplitude always is zero. It doesn't mean the wave is hopping from one side of the node to the other. It just need, means its mathematical sign is changing. Um, let's see. Here I have uh, some different kind of standing waves. Uh, these are standing waves like you would get, whoa, what happened there? Ah, yes, the new iPad iOS. If you touch the bottom of the screen, it thinks you want to move. I'll have to be careful with that. Anyway, um, this, what we've got here are strings constrained at both ends, and these are the allowed standing waves. Any other wave frequency would collapse. So you have the first one, which is sort of half a wavelength long. The nodes, the zero points, are at the end. And then we have the maximum slash minimum in the middle. All right. If you were on a guitar or a piano, this would be the first harmonic. This would be the note, major note that you would hear. Uh, and then any, any other combination of wavelengths where you can fit in an even or, uh, let's see, where you can fit in half of a wavelength. So here is one half, here is two halves. That's the slightly higher harmonic. Notice that for that, and we might call this the n equals one harmonic, and this the n equals two. Uh, notice as we go up a level, uh, we have a new node, which I'm, I guess I'm getting sort of off. There we go, pretty close. Yeah. All right, so notice that um, we didn't have a node here, but when we go up a level, we do, right? And then you can incorporate more and more as you go to higher frequencies. Now, why are we doing this? You didn't think this, this was physics or acoustics or whatnot, but uh, chemistry's easier to learn if you have useful analogies. And it turns out waves are a useful way to think about electrons. Uh, you have learned about 
uh, electrons in introductory chemistry. Uh, and in part, you may have started thinking about them as particles, little negatively charged things flying through space. Um, you may have heard about orbitals, S, P, D, and so on, but you may not have, you know what they look like, but you may have a difficult sense of what they are. In this class, we're going to consider uh, that the electron is a wave, a standing wave. Uh, its constraints are not the ends of a string, but rather the uh, constraint of a positively charged nucleus. And the orbitals are the standing waveforms that are allowed for that situation. Okay, so you can think of from here on out an, an, an elect, ugh, sorry, think about that, an electron in a 1s orbital looks like the 1s orbital. All right, we'll, we'll say, have more to say about that in a second. Um, to illustrate some of these points, I am a, whew, what should we do here? I am a primary chorister. It's the best calling, and I hope it's a lifelong calling. Um, I'm, I'm uh, except some of the kids are hecklers, but I'm uh, well prepared for that. I do not play the guitar. This is my son's guitar. I promised I would take it, bring it back um, in one piece, which is why I'm going to bang it against the lab bench. Um, all right, so we're going to set up a standing wave. And I want, my goal here is to convince you that the wave exists on both sides of the node. Oh, that was back. Input, that's probably the right thing, right? Yeah. I should turn the volume up to 11 before I turn it on, right? That's how we do things. <laughs> that worked, all right. Okay. Mm. Nice, that's too loud. Oh, feedback, that's gonna be fun. Okay, so I was having my son, who's a sophomore mechanical engineering student, uh, show me this today, or yesterday, and this was not rehearsed, so whatever. Um, so he showed me that uh, if we play a note here, and I, I am a musician, but I forget what the guitars are. He tells me this is E flat tuned, whatever that means. Uh, so that note, what you're hearing there, is the first harmonic. You're hearing the vibration where this, there's just a maximum in the middle and the nodes of the wave are at either end. But superimposed on that are higher order harmonics. And uh, we can hear them uh, by an interesting trick. What we're going to do is we're going to strike the string and then we're going to tap the string at this position, okay? And that's going to disturb all of the waves that have maxima in the middle, right? But if we're right and we touch it at the node, that shouldn't disrupt that harmonic, okay? And if you know anything about music, uh, you go up one... Uh, half wavelength, we're going to hear not the major note, but we're going to hear the octave, eight notes higher, okay? At least that's what I think is going to happen here. Uh, and uh, if we had a camera that was detailed enough, we could zoom in on the string. What you're going to see is the string, what you would see is the string vibrates here. Well, that's, I'm going to tap right here uh, in the middle of the string, and you may say, well, this is boring. You're just playing the note one octave higher. That's what a fret does, presumably. And the answer is, yeah, but I'm not pressing the fret down completely. I'm just tapping the string to dampen the first harmonic. My goal is to show you that the wave exists on both sides of that node and to show you that multiple waves can be superimposed. All right, so let's try this. Did you hear that go up an octave? Whoops. Or, uh. Right? 
I asked my son to show me, if he could show me in five minutes how to play the Van Halen solo from Eruption, which he says is not actually as hard as uh, it looks or, or sounds, but uh, he told me he was not. So. so that's the extent of my uh, guitar knowledge there. Um, right, so what we've learned so far is that waves can, uh, well, you know what we've learned so far. Uh, let's talk about how this applies to the electron. Uh, we're going to think of the electron as a standing wave, as I said, and the orbitals that you've learned about are simply the allowed wave form, okay? So uh, everything we know about the electron comes from the Schrodinger equation, and uh, you've seen that before. Uh, and you've looked at it and you've probably thought, okay, that's great. I know the letter H and I know the letter E. And I also know that Raphael the Ninja Turtle used to wield a sword that looked kind of like that. <laughs> that's the Greek letter psi. And um, it represents the wave function. We're going to refer to the wave form that the electron adopts as the wave function. And it's a mathematical function, and it's complicated enough that it's not fun to write down out explicitly. You can, um, but uh, we're going to simply draw what the wave function looks like. Uh, the, ha the H here is also a function. It's called the Hamiltonian, and it describes it describes the behavior of this electron wave around a positively charged nucleus. And it takes care of, basically, the kinetic energy of the wave, the kinetic energy of the electron, because the electron has mass and velocity, so it has kinetic energy. And then it's also going to take care of the potential energy of the electron around the nucleus. And that's just Coulomb's law, right? I'm, I'm really seriously not going to test you on this, but if you wanted to remember the energy between two charges is that. And that term is in the Hamiltonian, okay? Uh, kinetic energy, you learned uh, in physics, one-half mv squared. That's, that's good enough for now, though. We'll uh, be a little bit more specific in a minute, all right? So uh, to solve the Schrodinger equation, you have to know uh, what this function is, and then you identify a wave that when you apply this function to the wave, it returns the wave again, and uh, a, a numerical number, the energy level of that wave, okay? Um, Mathematicians out there, uh, these are referred to as eigenfunctions and these are eigenvalues, whatever that means. That, that was like 27 years ago or something. All right, so let's think about a hydrogen atom uh, around a positively, or rather a, one electron around a positively charged nucleus. Hydrogen you've learned, uh, has a 1s orbital. Its principal quantum number is 1. You could think of that as our n equals 1 first uh, harmonic. And if we're to plot what this wave function looks like, let's have the zero point uh, on our x-axis is just going to be distance. And our zero point uh, is going to be the nucleus. The origin is going to be the nucleus. Okay, and uh, then we're going to show what uh, the wave function, we're going to plot the wave function as uh, with distance on either side of the nucleus. Now I have to be a little bit careful here. It turns out that waves, mathematical expressions for waves actually involve the imaginary number and Euler's rule or whatever, e to the i x, which is mind-blowing. So I'm just going to show you the real part of the wave function, uh, but most of the time, uh, yeah, we're just going to ignore the imaginary stuff. Um, so let's put amplitude on this axis, 
and then I'm going to plot the wave function in red. And it turns out that the wave function has a maximum at the nucleus. That's mind blowing. And then drops off with increasing distance. And it does so in a symmetrical way. All right. Uh, it's one of those functions that approaches zero as you go to infinity on either way, uh, on either end, but it still has a finite value even at very, very, very far distances. But for all practical purposes, it's, it's zero. Uh, if you, so what we will typically do, uh, let's show you what this would look like in, three, uh, in 3D. Well, 2D drawn 3D. Here's hydrogen atom. And we're going to draw the 1s orbital surrounding it, and it's just a circle. And one of the great things about this app is I don't even have to draw nice circles anymore. Um, all right. And notice that uh, we have two, we have the ability to have positive amplitude and negative amplitude. Uh, but notice that, and this is a snapshot in time. But what we're seeing is uh, the, the wave, and uh, it's all the same sign across the whole area. What I'm plotting here in terms of the, the uh, this circle or a sphere would be if we said, uh, if we identified, say, some, uh, if we said we want to know the radius at which 99% uh, of the, 99% of the area under the curve is, is, is within those bounds, that's the circle we're drawing here. And in fact, the wave function itself, and it's, the math is sort of a pain, when you have an imaginary number, you take the complex conjugate of it, multiply it by itself, and you get an actual real number, wave function squared, please don't write that down. Uh, but wave function squared is the probability of finding the electron, oops, sometimes we can't write, finding the electron uh, at a certain location or within certain bounds. And so when you want to draw an orbital, you do math that says basically, I want to know the, uh, the areas, I want you to draw the areas where the electron can be within 95% probability or within 99% uh, probability. And that's what we're drawing here. I'm shading this circle a single color to indicate that the wave function sign is the same all the way through. All right? Uh, questions so far? Yes? What does it mean for an electron to have a positive amplitude? What does it mean for an electron to have a positive amplitude? Nothing physical. Uh, it simply means that it's a wave and it can have a plus amplitude or a negative amplitude. So uh, the, the, the sign of the wave function uh, doesn't mean anything other than there are two opposite signs and you can go through zero. Others? Yeah. Why is there psi on each side of the equation? Oh, I'm so glad you asked because um, it really is because of the kinetic energy term. Uh, think about this. The wave function has a general form of e to the x, uh, where this is something, and there's an imaginary number in there. I'm sorry, you asked. Uh, this is more math than you're going to do. But if you remember from calculus, the first derivative of e to the x is just e to the x again. Though often, if this is a larger expression, you'll have some other thing that comes out front. That's the kind of situation we're dealing with. Uh, part of the kinetic energy term in the Schrodinger equation is a second derivative. And so if you take the second derivative of e to the x, you just got e to the x times whatever comes out because of the chain rule. This is not a math class. And uh, I, I know some of the math, but I can't explain it. I don't know. Is that, is that good enough? Why can't they just cancel out? Uh, why can't what cancel out? Oh, uh, it's not about um, why can't they both cancel out? Because this is, uh, these, uh, h here is an actual function which doesn't have any meaning unless you apply it to the wave. 
So you have to apply it to the wave and then you get the wave again plus the energy value. Uh, it turns out, and we could go into a lot of details, this H often we show with a caret, which means it's an operator, it's a function. If you know what the wave function is, then you know everything that can be known about that electron. And you just have to have the right operator. There are energy operators, which is the Hamiltonian. There's a momentum operator. There's a position operator. And, you know, if you want to know more, we can talk more about it. I'd have to it will be convoluted because it's easier to understand something than to explain it to somebody. But, uh, okay, other questions? Yeah. So that graph you show, you're showing, that's showing that the electrons most likely to be found at the amplitude, correct? So um, the graph is showing if we could plot out the, the uh, mathematical value of the wave function as we go from very far to the nucleus to very close, um, we would, this is, yeah, this is what the value of the wave function would be. What I've colored in is the area within which we could have like 90x, 95x or whatever percent of probability. Yeah. I'm doing cruddy with the math. I hope that's okay, right? Yeah. So what Patrick's saying is that so you're saying that there's a 95% probability that the electron will be found in that circumstance. That's right. A 95% probability that the electron would be found here. But we are not thinking anymore. You need to get rid of this idea in your mind. We are not thinking anymore about an electron that's just bouncing off the insides of this sphere. No, the electron adopts a wave that has the shape of that sphere. Can you do that? Yeah. So could you think of it sort of very basically like the kind of same algorithm that high school where it's flying around the nucleus of that thing, but in a certain way of it, like a wave looking thing up here? Um, can you still think of an electron as flying around the nucleus? Uh, again, I guess I would discourage that because I'm still imagining a little spaceship and, and, and then if you just trace out its path overall. No, we're going to think of the electron as, as being able to be in more than one place at once, spreading out through space to occupy that space. All right. Okay. Now it gets worse. <laughs> So, um, I told you uh, a little bit about the kinetic energy of the wave function. It, and, and again, this is, what I'm doing is trying to lay the basis for some qualitative principles that we're going to apply. You honestly aren't going to be doing this math. But I think it's useful enough that I'm going to spend just a minute on it. Uh, the kinetic energy operator uh, within the Hamiltonian is uh, the following function, minus h bar, that's Planck's constant, divided by two times the mass of the nuclear, or mass of the electron, just put the electron there, uh, and then second derivative of the wave function with respect to distance from the nucleus. You didn't want to know that, and I don't want to know that either. But uh, it's, it, the payoff is, is pretty, is, is good enough that I think it's worth the time. So uh, if we have the first derivative of a function, if we take some function f and then take the first derivative of it, that gives us what? Qualitatively, what, what does the first derivative tell you about a function? Slope, or velocity, sure, if it's a, a position versus time. Slope, right? Slope of the function at a point. Uh, second derivative, then, is simply how the slope is changing. Slope of the slope, which sounds not that useful. Maybe we should just say how the slope changes, how quickly the slope is changing. Or we could call it, some people call it curvature. Um, so uh, what we're going to see, what this tells you is uh, kinetic energy 
is lower. Don't worry about this negative sign. Uh, I told you there's an I, uh, an imaginary number in here. So kinetic energy is always positive. It can never be negative. And the reason that the place that gets canceled out is when we take the second derivative of e to the i x, and then the two i's come out to the front. I know that like only two of you care about that. I'm really sorry. Um, so we're going to find that wave functions where the slope changes quickly have higher energy. Uh, let's go back to our standing wave. You can see that uh, for the n equals 1 wave, the slope is changing rather slowly. It's positive here, positive here, a little less positive, a little less positive. OK, now we're 0 at the max, and then now we're negative. Uh, changes not very much across this distance. The n equals 2 starts to change faster, because we got to be to a slope equals 0 by the time we get here, not by the time we get there. All right? Uh, so, in general, what you see with waves is that uh, higher uh, harmonic waves uh, have higher kinetic energy. They go through zero more often because the slope is changing more. So, in general, we're going to see that orbitals that have more nodes and whose uh, shape is changing more rapidly with space are going to be higher in energy. Okay, so um, let me show you how this is important in bonding. Uh, anybody want to ask any follow-up questions about that? The takeaway is just that when the electron density or when the uh, wave form of the electron changes slope more rapidly, when the wave function is more curved, when there are more nodes, when you go through zero more often, you're higher in energy. Follow-up? Yeah. Yep, does that correlate with 1s, 2s? Absolutely. So um, the 1s orbital looks like this. I'm going to erase the h in there, and we're just going to think about a generic orbital. Okay, this is 1s. Oh, right, I've got to change the pen. Then, and this is interesting, the 2s orbital is kind of the same thing except... Maybe they didn't tell you this in general chemistry. Uh, the 2s orbital is concentric spheres where uh, the inside sphere has one wave function sign. I, I hesitate to put plus or minus there because we're going to start thinking about charge. So I'm going to use color, but just re know that that represents opposite signs of the wave function. And then outside this surface, uh, this surface is a place where wave function goes to zero. It's a node, only it's a node surface. On the outside of that surface, everywhere else, you've got the other sign of the wave function. All right? Yeah. That's right. In the 1s, we have uniform sign of the wave function at any particular time. In the 2s orbital, if we were to sort of plot that out, and because it's spherical and symmetric all the way around, I'm only going to show you one side. Here's our origin. Here's uh, distance from the nucleus r. Yeah, we're going to drop through 0, come to another maximum, and then go back to 0. Except I wanted that to be... Red, no eraser needed. That's pretty cool. All right. And notice that uh, compared to our graph above, this, if you were to evaluate the second derivative, you would see that it is higher in magnitude. We are changing the slope more rapidly. And correspondingly, the wave function is higher in energy. Okay? So that's uh, one important observation. You don't need to know these graphs. You don't need to know math. You just need to be able to tell the difference between two different colors. I will try to avoid red-green colorblind issues. If, if that affects any of you here or there are other color combinations that are hard, far hard for you to distinguish, please let me know, and I can try to choose different ones. Um, 
but you just need to know that the more nodes you have, the higher in energy you are, okay? So uh, that's sort of one principle you can get uh, from uh, understanding uh, orbitals. Uh, another principle is the farther away you are from the nucleus, the higher in energy you are. That's the potential energy term of the Hamiltonian. Uh, notice that you've got, it's got a one over R relationship. As R gets bigger, potential energy, which is negative, I should have put a negative there. Potential energy is always negative. It's always favorable to have an electron near a nucleus. The zero point for a potential energy is infinite distance of the electron from the nucleus. Um, so we're going to see that as R goes to infinity, the potential energy goes to zero. So the closer you are to the nucleus, the lower you are in energy. And this is why uh, we can take uh, within the same sort of principal quantum number, we can then draw the two p orbitals, which you've learned to draw as this lovely figure eight. And probably they colored one side one color and the other side another color. Uh, and they maybe didn't even tell you what the colors represented. These are opposite signs of the wave function. Uh, and if we looked, this is sort of the side view. I'm gonna draw a plane, not a like airplane, but a plane plane. I guess that didn't help. I'm gonna sh shade in gray all the places where wave function equals zero. This is going to be our node plane. And uh, it will help us with the p orbitals to adopt some kind of axis system. So let's say up and down is z. Let's say out toward us is uh, y. And let's say this way is x. I realize that that's maybe one or two people out there are worried about whether this is right-handed or left-handed coordinate system. I, I don't care. Okay, uh, so because this, this orbital is aligned along the z-axis, so we would call this the 2pz orbital. If we tried to, if we looked from the top down, uh, and sometimes the ability to use color is a distracting thing. I often cannot resist um, converting eyeballs into evil Sith eyes. Um, I showed my, my youngest son is now 11, just ordained a deacon yesterday, but um, when he was young, maybe four, we all, all of the boys, I have four sons, we watched Revenge of the Sith, which was maybe a little mature for a four-year-old, um, but, uh, and so what he remembers from that is Anakin burned up with these eyes yelling, I hate you at Obi-Wan, and that was actually pretty a bit traumatizing for him. <laughs> I, I sort of got in trouble for that, but my attitude was, it's Star Wars, suck it up, right? But, all right, so if we were to look down from that perspective, what we would see from that top-down view is we'd see something like this, uh, that purple, we're gonna call that a lobe, I don't know why, and then, Below it, we would see the orange lobe. Now, sometimes when I draw p orbitals, I'm not gonna draw this node, but you're gonna know it's there because the color switched, right? I should point out that here is the nucleus. So interestingly, unlike the 2s orbital, where there is a maximum at the nucleus, and unlike the 1s orbital, where there's a maximum at the nucleus, uh, with the p orbital, there's zero at the nucleus. So a p orbital, electron in a p orbital will be farther from the nucleus than an electron in an s orbital, and therefore higher in energy. You guys learned that you probably drew something like this when you were doing electron configurations. That look familiar? Yeah, painful, painful memories. Um, the reason it's higher is because the electrons are farther from the nucleus. 
Another feature is whereas the 2s orbital and the 1s orbital are spherically symmetric, the p orbitals have directionality. They, they are not the same in all directions. This one, the 2pz is aligned along the x, or sorry, the z axis. Duh. Um, then you can draw the 2px aligned along the x axis. And then you can draw the 2py al aligned along the y axis. Okay? But again, with all of these, we're noticing that uh, they have a node. The node is a plane. In the case of the 2pz orbital, the node is the xy plane. And we could make similar statements about the 2px and the 2py orbitals. These are all, even though they point in different directions, they are all the same in energy. So the energy of the 2pz is equal to the energy of the 2px is equal to the energy of the 2py. But they're oriented at 90 degrees from each other. Okay? Question so far about the p orbitals. Yeah? Okay, sorry. So um, if this is an atom, then uh, this is where uh, the nucleus would be. Location of the nucleus of the atom. And so if I could, if we could zoom in. <laughs> Ooh, this is fun. We're going to take a close-up view. Uh, we would see the nucleus here. And we would see that that top lobe comes in and doesn't touch the nucleus, and the bottom lobe comes in and doesn't touch the nucleus. Yeah? So there's a place where the wave goes through zero. Yeah. Okay. Others? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so this is one of the mind-blowing things, and this is why I got the guitar out, is that uh, you have things like uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, which have filled their 1s orbital and have filled their 2s orbital and are now filling their 2p orbitals. All of those are in the same space. And how can that be? Well, quantum mechanics allows it. Uh, sim and it's the same thing, as you can pluck a guitar string and you've got all of these harmonics going. And it's fine. Waves are superimposable. And so that's the mind-blowing thing about electrons is in their wave form, they can, they're, they're negatively charged. They repel each other, but they can occupy the same space. That's fine as long as they don't have the same spin and the same energy. Yeah. So, no, uh, so uh, this would be easier, well, actually, let's just do that. Here is a program called Spartan, um, which calculates things. I'm just going to put oxygen there. Oh, it wants to do water. Well, um, I'll just draw it then. We'll use Spartan later. Yeah, I mean, you'd have, what we're talking about is if you wanted to draw a really messy drawing, you'd have a 2s orbital, or 1s orbital here, a 2s orbital here, and then you'd have the 2p, at z, x, and y. All, and, and you used to think about, uh, probably when you were younger, orbitals as being like this, little pathways that electrons are around. I'm telling you, it's like this, and each of these is the space which an electron occupies. Okay? Yeah? Oh, good question. So uh, this n equals 1 and n equals 2, you can think of as the principal quantum numbers on the periodic table. n equals 1 is for hydrogen and helium. n equals 2 is for the next row. Uh, and then I forget what else, wh what it is. Oh, man, see, you don't have to know a lot to take this class. You don't even have to know a lot to teach this class. Uh, there's a second quantum number, L, um, which tells you whether you're S or P, I think. 
and then there's another quantum number that tells you which p orbital you are. We won't worry about that, but. Oh, is it possible for a p orbital to be only one of these? No. Yeah. Like this here? Yeah. No, that's the S type orbital. This is a P type orbital. In fact, it's actually a pretty direct analogy, right? If you look at those graphs that we did above, this looks like the uh, S orbital in terms of its sym symmetry, and this one goes through zero in the middle. That's the P orbital. Okay? All right. Yes? Ah, no. If, the P, if, if, uh, if, if I have a P orbital and an electron's in it, is it bouncing back and forth between two sides? Oh, shoot, I lost Jack's pick. Maybe I put it in my pocket. No, it's somewhere. Anyway, no, in the same way that I can bring out that higher harmonic and the wave was on both sides at once. The electron is the wave. So this is the weird part. It's simultaneously occupying both spaces. It goes through zero, but it doesn't hop from one side to the other like a wave. It is that space, and the colors represent the sign. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. I think you have. I think I have two minutes. One minute. Okay. So hang in there. We're going to start talking about bonding. And bonds, you've learned, a covalent bond is when you share electrons, right? You were taught about bonding in hydrogen, and they can both get noble gas configuration, and that's good, yay. That is, um, that is a three-year-old sort of level understanding of bonding, and we're going to go to kindergarten level. <laughs> I'm teasing. It's, this is all very hard, I know. Um, we're going to talk about bonding in terms of overlap of waves with each other. You know that waves can undergo constructive and destructive interference, right? If I timed a wave such that at each point, if I added a wave that was exactly opposite to this one, at each point along the pathway, it collapses to zero, right? Whereas if I added another wave that's the same frequency and in the same positions, they would add together. We're going to see that bonding involves orbitals adding together either in constructive or destructive ways. Um, and that's going to tell us that with a, well, now I'm done, I think, for the day. So stay tuned for more. Read the syllabus online. I will see you Wednesday. Yeah. This, I'm sorry, the syllabus? Oh, I forgot to enable that. Let me just actually... No, there is a... I think this will take me just a click to do. It will actually show up in that top banner. I knew I needed... Yeah, it will... Uh, oh, your view is different from mine. I believe it will show up here. So I think all I have to do to enable that is... Plugins. Red shelf. Okay, uh, let's both try to refresh and see what we got. Maybe take a minute. Okay, I'll get that. That should have been taken care of. It will be taken care of shortly. Yeah. And are there any specific molecular models that we should have this class? Um, no, uh, they, they will help with your spatial reasoning. You can get expensive ones, not expensive ones. I wouldn't spend a lot of money. Um, most of them will be okay. All of them are limited <laughs> in what they do. So, no, I prefer a ball and stick one because it makes it easier to tell where the atoms are. But, yeah.
question as well. Is there, should we be looking at the study guide for like, what we're prepared for next class? Or? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. What are the, is there a so, the syllabus will show you how long, well, the syllabus will show you how long we're going to spend on each subject, each chapter, one study guide per chapter. So we may go longer than scheduled on the syllabus on any particular topic, but, you know, for example, if we're going to spend two days on chapter three, then you want to do about half of chapter three before the first day and then the rest after. And is there more on the study guide? Yes, there will be problems on the study guide. So it's towards the end, probably? They will show. They should show up in blue. Okay. So you won't turn those in. The syllabus will give you details. You'll just report that you did them. Thank you so much. Yep. Hey. Chris, my name is Ethan. I'm one of the TAs this Hi, semester. Um, right now, I'm still waiting on them to terminate one of my jobs last semester.